Right. Hello. We're going to be doing zigglings today. And I actually started this the other night on a on my laptop, but I wasn't filming it, so I'm starting again. I'm going to record it all. Uh, but I haven't installed Zig on this computer yet. Ah, I remember it was with Snap, wasn't it? The reason I'm interested in Zig is because I'm looking for a new favourite programming language. I've played with Go a little bit, and Go could be the winner, but I don't like that Go is garbage collected, mainly. Um, Rust, I really wanted to like, but I found to be too bloated. The borrow check is a great idea, but didn't go on with the rest of it. Um, so, have a look at Zig. Zig, I'm not completely sure will be the winner because it's not fully memory safe. But maybe by the time I get to the end of Ziglings, I'll know whether I like it or not. Okay, oh, the other thing I wanted to do was in this window, I'll have it automatically rebuild. The format of Ziglings is similar to the format of Rustlings which is a series of source files that all have a problem in and you learn the language by working through the source files and solving the problems. So, um, let's do something like this. And able to start. Okay, good. That'll probably do us. So, now I have got a Zig, yeah, I've got a Zig plugin for Vim, which formats my code every time I save it. And I think if I type in nonsense, yeah, it puts um, it puts some compile errors in Vim, although it doesn't put all in. Because, for example, this doesn't build, but it doesn't give me any errors in Vim. I'm not completely sure how it decides what its problem. Main is not marked pub. Oh no, this program is supposed to print Hello World, but it needs your help. It may need to be up. Very good. Past Hello World. On to problem two. This program is supposed to print a line like our Hello World example, but we forgot how to import the standard library. Const sturdy quiz import stuff. Passed, very good. We got a little carried away making everything const u8. Const values cannot change. Please fix this program so that types can hold the desired values. So n needs to be variable. Pi needs to be larger than 8. I thought it was really interesting that Zig lets you make arbitrary sized integers. So you can make a u20, for example. And it just works. It's a 20-bit it's a integer. Pretty cool. I've never seen that before. Let's learn some array basics. Problem one. Const is going to cause a problem later. Yes, because we assigned to it. So we make it bar. Problem two. Looks like we need to complete this expression. Set the fourth element of the array. Use the len property to get the length of the array. That's a pretty strange way to get the length of an array. Well, I suppose it's not that strange. Size five. Zig so has some fun array operators. You can use plus plus to concatenate two arrays. You can use star star to repeat an array. Only operate on arrays while your program is being compiled. 
Please let this array result in concatenating the two arrays above. Please set this array using repetition. Now that we've learned about arrays, we can talk about strings. We've already seen zig string list rules. Zig stores strings as arrays of bytes. It is almost the same as a literally just an array of bytes. Let's see what strings really are in exercise 77. Notice how individual characters use single quotes and strings use double quotes. These are not interchangeable. Get the letter D from the string stardust. Use the array repeat operator to make ha ha ha. Uh, use the concatenation operator. You need to add a space as well. We can't concatenate a single character. We need to concatenate a string. Here's a fun one, Zig has multi-line strings. And weirdly, they they don't have uh, an opening quote mark. You just put two backslashes at the front. Quiz time. Let's see if you can fix this whole program. Let the compiler tell you what's wrong. So it says, line 36, expected type expression following lines attempt to put zig into the lang array oh okay something like that. Uh, x equals 3, we can't assign to x. Now we get on to the fun stuff, starting with the if statement. If, true, else. I wonder if the brackets are required here. I'm guessing so, else they wouldn't show them. Expected bracket. Okay. So we want the foo equals one. If statements are also valid expressions, I wonder if that means it doesn't have a real ternary operator. Please use an if else expression to set price. I'm actually going to try and see if there's a ternary operator first. If discount is true, the price should be 70. No, annoying. Zig while statements create a loop that runs while the condition is true. This runs once at most. The condition must be a boolean. Please use the condition that is true until n reaches 1024. Equal to 1024. Zig while statements can have an optional continue expression which runs every time the while loop continues, either at the end of the loop or when an explicit continue is invoked. Which is interesting, I've never seen this before. Set the condition, set the continue expression so that we get the desired results in the print station statement below. This should result in n equals 1024. Right. Help to look back at the previous exercise. Hey, 
wants powers of two. The last two exercises were functionally identical. Okay, let's have a look back at them then. Uh, what was it, 11 and 12? Continue expressions really show their utility when used with continue statements. Every time the loop restarts, whether the continue statement happens or not. I want to print every number between 1 and 20 that is not divisible by 3 or 5. So if it is divisible by 3 or 5, we shall continue. You can force the loop to exit immediately with a break, express, uh, break statement. This while loop will go on forever. We want n equals 4. If n equals 4, break. Behold the for loop. For loops let you execute code for each element of an array. For items, item. It's a bit like the closure syntax in Rust. What does it want us to do? Something like that. For loops also let you store the index of the iteration, a number starting with zero that counts up with each iteration. You can name item and index anything you want. Quiz time again. Let's see if you can solve the famous fizz buzz. What kind of loop is this? A for or a while? This is a while and it has a continue expression. Expected semicolon after declaration. What's it here? This? Print the number, don't we? Functions. We've already created lots of functions called main. Now let's do something different. The foo function above takes a number n and returns a number that is larger by one. Yep, fine. New function deep thought should return 42. We're not missing the keyword pub because it's not public. U8. Let's create a function that takes a parameter. Just like any other types, name curl on type. Takes an integer. Let's say it takes a U32. Let's see if we can make use of some of the things we've learned so far. We'll create two functions, one that contains a for loop and one that contains a while loop. Both of these are simply labeled loop. Function that takes an array with exactly four U16 numbers. This is not how you would normally pass an array to a function. Okay, prints but does not return. Returns void, and that is a for loop. This one returns presumably a u16. That's a while loop. Returns total. 
Believe it or not, sometimes things go wrong in programs. In Zig, an error is a value. Errors are named so we can identify things that can go wrong. Errors are created in error sets, which are just a collection of named errors. We have the start of an error set, but we're missing the condition too small. Okay. So, no, there's more to here. common case for errors is a situation where we're expecting to have a value or something has gone wrong. So this is like result in Rust. What happens if get text can't find foo.txt? How do we express that? Zig lets us make what's called an error union, which is a value which can either be a regular value or an error from a set. I don't think we've seen text, have we? Well, looks like my number will need to either store a number or an error. Put an exclamation mark. One way to deal with error unions is to catch any error and replace it with a default value. Can fail catch six. If can fail fails, foo will equal six. Uh, please return. Please write the return type. It's an error union. Expected error set type. Maybe it has to be the other way around. Okay. Using catch to replace an error with a default value is a bit of a blunt instrument since it doesn't matter what the error is. Catch lets us capture the error value and perform additional actions with this form. Again, like the Rust closure syntax. Oh dear, this is missing a lot. It's nearly identical to fix too big above. If we get a too small error, we should return 10. If we get any other error, we should return that error. Zig has a handy try shortcut for this common error handling pattern. This is like writing a question mark after something in Rust. This function needs to return any error which might come back from detect. Please use a try statement rather than a catch. Great news, now we know enough to stand, understand a real Hello World program in Zig, one that uses the system's standard out resource, which can fail. Take note that this main definition now returns 
exclamation mark void rather than just void. Since there's no specific error type, this means that zig will infer the error type. This is appropriate in the case of main, but can have consequences elsewhere. I wonder what those consequences are. Standard writer can fail. We don't care what the error is. So try. You can assign some code to run after a block of code exits by deferring it. OK. In the example above, run later will run when the block is finished. This feature seems strange. It doesn't seem that strange. Go has the same thing. Or at least Go has something similar. Now that you know how defer works, let's do something more interesting with it. This function is supposed to print an animal name in parentheses, like goat, but we somehow need to print the end parenthesis, even though this function can return in four different places. Another common problem is a block of code that could exit in multiple places due to an error, but that needs to do something before it exits, typically to clean up after itself. An err defer is a defer that only runs if the block exits with an error. The cleanup function is called only if the try statement returns an error. I wonder in that case if it still returns the error to the caller or if it simply runs error defer instead of returning the error to the caller. Um, Please make the failed message print only if the main. Okay, fine. Let's go. I'm going to make this always return the error. Unreachable code. I don't care. Is that an error? Ah, oh, no slash star comments. Error unused function parameter. Does it let you do that? No. Ah, that's annoying. Error defer. It says getting number failed and it does not say continuing which implies even when the error defer runs, it still returns the error upwards. Now it should say failed continuing. Oh, okay, whatever. The switch statement lets you match the possible values of an expression and perform a different action for each. Yep, fine. We don't need everything in between. Switch statements must be exhaustive. Is that not contradictory? Please add an else to this switch to print a question mark when C is not one of the existing matches. What's really nice is that you can use a switch statement as an expression to return a value. As in the last exercise, I'd be asked, of course. Have a return of exclamation. 
Zig has an unreachable statement. Use it when you want to tell the compiler that a branch of code should never be executed and that the mere act of reaching it is an error. Here we've made a little virtual machine that performs mathematical operations. It looks great, but it doesn't cover every possible value. Use the unreachable statement to make the switch complete, or else. Let's revisit the very first error exercise. This time we're going to look at an error handling variation of the if statement. More of this funny closure syntax. Foo is not an error. Value is the non-error value of foo. So if foo is an error union and it's not an error, then it evaluates true and gives you the value. If it is an error, it evaluates false and gives you the value. I wonder if you can put this value syntax even when it's not an error union. Like if it's just a boolean. Unused capture. Oh, are you serious? Expected error union type variable. Okay, fine, you can only do that with error unions. What's. Please add a match for too small. Quiz time, see if you can make this program work. Solve this any way you like, just be sure the output is my num equals 42. Any way I like. Well, <laughs> do I just delete everything and print that? You will not be changing this function. Expected type void found error illegal number. Ah, I see. catch nothing. <laughs> okay, that'll do. <laughs> Remember that little mathematical virtual machine we made using the unreachable statement? Well, there were two problems with the way we were using opcodes. Having to remember opcodes by number is no good. We had to use unreachable because Zig had no way of knowing how many valid opcodes there are. An enum is a Zig construct that lets you give names to numeric values. Let's use an enum in place of the numbers we were using in the previous version. Okay, ink power deck. It doesn't appear that the order matters. Enums are really just a set of numbers. You can leave the numbering up to the compiler or you can assign them explicitly. You can even specify the numeric type used. 
get the integer out with at enum to int. Now how that built-in function starts with at, just like the at import function we've been using. So these lets us write integers in hex, web browsers let us specify colors in hex, define and use a pure blue value. Remember these multi-line strings, here they are again. Add this formatting to the blue value. Being able to group values together, let's just turn this into this. The point <laughs> above is an example of a struct. Here's how that struct type could have been defined. Let's store something fun with a struct, a role playing character. Character class is add a new property called health and make it a UX. Please initialize Glorp with 100 health. Glorp gains some gold. Ouch, Glorp takes a punch. Grouping values in structs is not merely convenient, it also allows us to treat the values as a single item when storing them. This exercise demonstrates how we can store structs in an array and how doing so lets us print them using a loop. Got the wise. Please add zump the loud. Feel free to run this program without adding some what does it do and why? Well, okay. Are we sure there's not multi-line comments? It doesn't highlight them, it doesn't compile. That's infuriating. So, I'm guessing the problem is that one of the characters is uninitialized. And that's kind of annoying because I thought part of the point of the new 21st century programming languages is that you don't have to deal with uninitialized memory. But okay. Add zump the loud following properties. He's a bard, he's 10 gold, 100 health, 20 experience. Okay, pointer is always a pointer, it's a reference to a value. Bar is a reference to the memory space that currently contains the value 5. Okay, that looks the same as C. Cheat sheet given the above declarations. U8, value 5, value of U8. Oh, sorry, the type of a pointer. Address of foo, pointer to foo, bar dot star. So that's the way you write value of in zig, which is weird. Why not do it the same way as C, when the rest of it is the same as C? Please make num2 equal 5 using num1 pointer. So num1 is 5, num1 pointer points to num1, so num2 has to be value of num1 pointer. It's important to note that variable pointers and constant pointers are different types. Address of foo is pointed to u8, address of bar is pointed to const u8. You can always make a constant pointer to a variable, but you cannot make a variable pointer to a constant. This sounds like a logic puzzle, but it just means that once data is immutable, you can't coerce it to mutable. 
it's a safety thing, okay? Fix this. So, we can do that. Oh, I think we can also do one to const do it. Yeah, either is fine. The tricky part is that the pointer's mutability refers to the ability to change what the pointer points to. Not the ability to change the value at that location. Both P1 and P2 point to const locked. Constant values which cannot change their pointers to const u8. However, P2 can be changed to point to something else and P1 can't. Okay, fine. P3 and P4 can both be used to change the value they point to. Even though P3 is const because it's a pointer to a non-const. P3 cannot point to anything else. P5 and P6 act like P1 and P2 but point to the value are un But point to the value are unlocked. Don't p oh act like p1 and p2, not like p3 and p4. This is what we mean when we say that we can make a constant reference to any value. Okay, you can coerce something to const, but you can't coerce something out of const. Define p so that it can point to either foo or bar. So that's a bar, and it can change the value it points to. So that's a pointer to u8. Now let's use pointers to do something we haven't been able to do before. Pass a value by reference to a function. Why would we wish to pass a pointer to an integer variable rather than the integer value itself? Because then we're allowed to change the value. Pass by reference when you want to change the value, otherwise pass the value. So reference num to a function. Let's pass a reference to a specific array value. I always hated this kind of syntax in C. I would prefer to see this. I'm guessing that's not allowed. Uh, invalid left hand side to assignment. Oh, it's As with integers, you can pass a pointer to a struct when you will wish to modify that struct. Pointers are also useful when you need to store a reference to a struct, a link to it. I don't understand why we're throwing around references and links when they just seem to mean the same thing as pointer. Note that you don't need to dereference the PV pointer to access the struct's field. Okay, we can write functions that take pointers to structs as arguments. This foo function modifies struct v. I'll call them like so. Fine, straightforward. Revisit our RPG, make a print character function. Prints it and prints a linked mentor character if there is one. Please pass glorb to print character. When switching an enum, you don't have to write the full enum name. Okay, so instead of class.wizard, etc., we just write. Elephants walking along the trails are holding hands by holding tails. Please add elephant B. Please link elephant B's tail to elephant C. Sometimes you know that a variable might hold a value or it might not. Zig has a neat way of expressing this idea called optionals. 
an optional type just has a question mark like this. Now foo can store a u30 integer or null, a value storing the cosmic horror of a value not existing. So this is like option in Rust, although much less verbose, which is a good thing. Before we can use the optional value as the non-null type, we need to guarantee that it isn't null. One way to do this is to threaten it with the or else statement. Here bar will either equal the u32 integer value stored in foo, or it will equal 2 if foo was null. Please threaten the result so that the answer is either the integer value from deep thought or the number 32. 42, sorry. Now that we have optional types, we can apply them to structs. The last time we checked in with our elephants, we had to link all three of them together in a circle so that the last tail linked to the first elephant. This is because we had no concept of a tail that didn't point to another elephant. Well, we have undefined, don't we? Is that a compile error if we miss one out? Oh no, we forgot elephant B. Terminated unexpectedly. Um, I'm curious if this testing framework has hidden some debug output from me. It sounds like it, com it compiled it and then it checked it. So it sounds like it does compile even if the pointer is undefined. But it terminates unexpectedly if you try to use an undefined pointer. Now that we have optional types, we can apply them to structs, blah blah blah. We also introduce the handy dot question mark shortcut. It's the same as asserting that it's not null. See so if you can find where we use it below. Uh, there you go, found it. We should stop once we encounter a tail that does not point to another element. What can we put here to make that happen? Either break or return. Expected type elephant found type of null. Hmm, tail needs something. Ah, what did it say? Now that we have optional types, did we put a Help! Evil alien creatures have hidden eggs all over the earth and they're starting to hatch. Before you jump into battle, you'll need to know four things. You can attach functions to structs by putting them inside the struct. A function that is a member of a struct is a method and is called with the dot syntax. The neat feature of methods is the special parameter named self that takes an instance of that type of struct. I wonder why it doesn't take a pointer. Maybe it is, secretly a pointer. Now when you call the method on an instance of that struct, the instance will be automatically passed as the self parameter. Okay, your arms. Now please zap the alien structs until they're all gone or Earth will be doomed. Trusty weapons, up with aliens. Look at all of these aliens. Marks. Is that the alien with the heat ray here? A heat ray struct. Zap. Oh, this does take a pointer. Up here, they told us it simply takes an ordinary one. 
maybe you get to choose. Not sure. Anyway, zap takes self and an alien. So and a pointer to an alien. Star makes a pointer capture value. Heat ray zap. Now that we've seen how methods work, let's see if we can help our elephants out a bit more with some elephant methods. Get tail, has tail, visit print. This links the elephants so that each tail points to the next. Um, this function visits all elephants once, starting with the first elephant and following the tails to the next elephant. Which method do we want here? Trunks and tails are handy things. <laughs> okay. Now that we have tails all figured out, can you implement trunks? Do your elephant trunk methods go here? So we just want house trunk and get trunk. We live on a placid island of ignorance in the midst of black seas of infinity, and it was not meant that we should draw voyage far. Zig has at least four ways of expressing no value. Undefined, null, error, and void. What about zero? It's not really no value, is it? Undefined should not be thought of as a value, but when a way of telling the compiler that you're not assigning a value yet. Any type may be set to undefined, but attempting to read or use that value is always a mistake. So I think possibly using the word undefined is the only way we get uninitialized memory, which is good because it means we don't get it by accident, we only get it on purpose. The null primitive value is a value that means no value. This is typically used with optional types. Errors are very similar to nulls. They are a value, but they usually indicate that the real value you were looking for does not exist. Instead, you have an error. The example error union type of my error expression right u8 means that foo either holds a u8 or an error. Yep, fine. Void is a type, not a value. It is the most popular of the zero bit types. unmatched parenthesis. When compiled to executable code, zero bit types generate no code at all. The above example shows a variable foo of type void, which is assigned the value of an empty expression. It's much more common to see void as the return type. Okay, fine. Zig has all of these ways of expressing different types of no value because they each serve a purpose. No value yet. No value. Something went wrong. Never value. Please use the correct no value for each question mark, question mark, question mark. No value yet. Uh, something went wrong. Functions return void. So I'm guessing this one is null because it has a question mark. If you thought the last exercise was a deep dive, hold on to your hat because we're about to descend into the computer's molten core. Down here, the bits and bytes flow from RAM to the CPU like a hot, dense fluid. The forces are incredible. But how does all of this relate to the data in our ZIG programs? Let's head back up to the text editor and find out. 
Okay. Remember our old RPG character struct? A struct is really just a very convenient way to deal with memory. Its fields are all values of a particular size. Add them together and you have the size of the struct as a whole. Is there padding if you put them in a different order? Is there a size of operator? Don't know. Probably find out later. Here we create a character called the narrator that is a constant, immutable instance of a character struct. Stored in your program's data, loaded into RAM when your program runs. Global wizard is global but mutable. Function is instruction code at a particular address. Function parameters are always mutable, immutable. Stored in the stack. Okay. Often loaded into the beating heart of the CPU itself. Our main function here has no input parameters, but it will have a stack entry. Now let's circle back around to that STD struct we imported at the top. Once this CD is a struct. Sign std.debug.print. Now let's look at assigning and pointing to values. We'll try three different ways of making a new name to access our glorp character and change one of its values. Glorp access one is incorrectly named. We asked Zig to set aside memory for another character struct, so when we assign glorp to glorp access one, we're actually assigning all of the fields to make a copy. Now we have two separate characters. You don't need to fix this, but notice what gets printed in your program's output. Okay, I don't think we've got that far. If we tried to do this with a const character instead of a var, changing the gold field would give us a compile error because const values are immutable. Glorp access 2 will do what we want. It points to the original Glorp's address. Also remember that we get one implicit dereference with struct fields. So accessing the gold field looks just like accessing it from Glorp. Okay. Access 3 is interesting. It's also a pointer, but it's a const. Won't that disallow changing the gold value? No. As you may recall, a constant pointer can't change what it's pointing at, but the value at the address it points to is still mutable, so we can change it. If we tried to do this with a pointer to const character, this, well, that would not work, and we would get a compile error. Okay. Fix one of two goes here. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, make it a pointer. We've seen that passing arrays around can be awkward. Perhaps you remember a particularly horrendous function definition from quiz three. This function can only take arrays that are exactly four items long. That's the trouble with arrays. Their size is part of the data type and must be hard-coded into every usage of that type. This digits array is a 10u8 forever and ever. Thankfully, Zig has slices, which let you dynamically point to a start item and provide a length. Here are slices of our digit array. As you can see, a slice x dot dot y starts with the index of the first item at x and the last item at y minus y. You can leave y off to get the rest. It's bracket bracket u8. First four cards in hand one, and the rest in hand two. I don't like that um, the y value gives you stuff up to y minus 1. Perl has a dot dot operator like this, but if you write 0 dot dot 2, you'll get 0, 1, and 2. Whereas in Zig, it looks like you're going to get 0 and 1. Please lend this function a hand, a u8 slice hand, that is. You are perhaps tempted to try slices on strings. They are arrays of U8 characters after all, right? Slices on strings work great. There's just one catch. Don't forget that Zig string literals are immutable values. So we need to change the type of slice from 
slice of u8 to slice of const u8. Fix this zero when inspired phrase descrambler. You just write const everywhere. You can also make pointers to multiple items without using a slice. The difference between foo slice and foo pointer is that the slice has no length, the pointer doesn't. It's up to you to keep track of the number of u8s foo pointer points to. And what happens if you try to read too many? Is that somewhere where zig doesn't have memory safety in it, just happily lets you read past the end. Zen 12 is a pointer to a constant 21 element array of U8s, I want to say. Now let's turn this into a many item pointer. A many item pointer to const u8s. It's okay to access then many pointer just like an array of slices as long as you keep track of the length yourself. A string in zig is a pointer to an array of const u8 values. So we could treat a many item pointer of const u8 as a string as long as we can convert it to a slice. Hint, we do know the length. So we can treat a many item pointer as a string as long as we can convert it to a slice. Oh, we'll just tell it the length. So is that a slice or is that an array? Twenty one const. Is that a slice? to modify a const is not allowed on a ray child type. So yeah, so this is a slice, and we can assign into the slice from a pointer as long as we specify the number of elements. Okay, are all of these pointer types starting to get confusing? Free zig pointer cheat sheet. Well, that's in number 54, so if we need it, we can look in 54. A union lets you store different types and sizes of data at the same memory address. How is this possible? The compiler sets aside enough memory for the largest thing you might want to store. In this example, an instance of foo always takes up u64 of space, even if you're currently storing a u8. Syntax looks just like a struct, but can only hold a small or a medium or a large. Yeah. Once a field becomes active, the others cannot be accessed. Okay. Started writing a simple ecosystem simulation. Insects represented by either bees or ants. 
bees store the number of flowers they visited and ants store whether or not they're still alive. Use an enum. It is really quite inconvenient having to manually keep track of the active field in our union, isn't it? Thankfully, Zig also has tagged unions, which allow us to store an enum value within our union, representing which field is active. Now we can use a switch directly on the union to act on the active field. So you put the name of your enum in brackets after union to get a tagged union. You can switch on a value of a tagged enum, and the cases are the field names, so does this simply have to have the same names as our union? I'm guessing so. Optional values are basically null unions, and errors use error union types. Now we can add our own unions to the mix to handle any, handle whatever situations we might encounter. With tagged unions, it gets even better. If you don't have a need for a separate enum, you can define an inferred enum with your union all in one place. Just use the enum keyword in place of the tag type. Okay, that makes a lot more sense other than having to um, write out all the field names twice. Let's convert insect. Dr. Zoraptor has already deleted the explicit enum. So we just write that. We've absorbed a lot of information about the variations of types we can use in Zig. Roughly, in order, we have U8, single item, pointer U8, single item pointer, slice of U8, 5 U8. So I'm curious exactly how similar slices and arrays are, given that the syntax is very similar. I think a slice doesn't actually have its own memory. A slice is just a pointer and a length, whereas an array has its own memory. A many item pointer is simply a slice with no explicit length. Um, enums, errors. Oh, interestingly, errors are exactly the same as enums. Except you can make error unions out of them. Strikes as you expect. Unions, but it has tagged unions built in. Very good. Values of any of the above types can be assigned as var or const to allow or disallow changes via the assigned name. Yep, we can also make error unions or optional types from any of the above. U8 or error from set E, U8 or null. Knowing all of this, maybe we can help out a local hermit. He made a little zig program to help him plan his trips through the woods, but it has some mistakes. You do not have to read and understand every bit of this program. This is a very big example. Feel free to skim through it and then just focus on the few parts that are actually broken. Okay, 471 lines. Note that we declare that the place is mutable because we need to assign paths later. Why is that? Because paths contain pointers to places. Assigning them now would create a dependency loop.
Okay. Seems like a lot of tedious manual labour. We haven't learned how to do that yet. Fine. Once we've plotted out the best course through the woods, we'll make a trip out of it. Uh, okay, oops, the hermit forgot how to capture the union values in a switch statement. I expect it was like this. But that is not all. Line 207. No. Uh, This can't actually happen since every place is reachable. So uh, it returns another error here. So I, we need to make this either trip error or void. Function return type declared here. Here's where the hermit got stuck. We need to return an optional pointer to a notebook entry. What we have with entry is the opposite, a pointer to an optional notebook entry. To get one from the other, we need to dereference entry and get the non-null value from the optional and return the address of that. Yay. Zig lets you express integer literals in several convenient formats. These are all the same value. I shall take your word for it. You can also place underscores in numbers, good. Please fix the message. It's supposed to say Zig is cool. Tempted to just make it say Zig is cool. Zig has support for floating point numbers in these specific sizes. Okay, so unlike integers, you can't specify arbitrary sizes. Floating point literals may be written in scientific notation. Hex floats can't use the letter E. Okay for the exponent. Be sure to use a float type that is large enough. Rounding may or may not be okay. A float literal has a decimal point. Fix the two float problems with this program and display the result as a whole number. Maybe we just make it wider. Didn't it say two float problems? I think there's only one float problem. It'll only take us a moment to learn the zig type coercion rules because they're quite logical. Types can always be made more restrictive. Numeric types can coerce to larger types but isn't a larger type less restrictive? Single item pointers to arrays coerce to slices and many item pointers. Single item pointers to arrays. Oh, I see. Yeah, not pointers to single item arrays. Single item pointers. Is there any other kind? Well, many item pointers. Okay, fine. <laughs> single item mutable pointers can coerce to single item pointers pointing to an array of length one, which is apparently interesting. Okay. Payload types are null, coerce to optionals. Uh, Yep, okay. 
payload types and errors coerce to error unions, undefined coerces to any type, compile time numbers coerce to compatible types. Just about every single exercise program has had an example of this but a full and proper explanation is coming your way soon in the third eye-opening subject of comp time. Tagged unions coerce to the current tagged enum. What does current mean? Enums coerce to a tagged union when that tagged field is a zero length type that has only one value, like void. Enums coerce to a tagged union. Zero length type that only has one value. Okay. Zero bit types can be coerced into single item pointers. Your type here must coerce from a pointer to a U8. Use coercion rules four and five. Single item mutable pointers can coerce to single item pointers pointing to an array of length one. Payload types are null, coerced to optionals. Well, why don't we make it a pointer to one U8? Expected optional type. Remember using if else statements as expressions? Yes, I do, and I wish I could write ternary operators. Zig also lets you use for and while loops as expressions. Like return for functions, you can return a value from a loop block with break. Turn a Boolean value from a block. But what value is returned from a loop if a break statement is never reached? We need a default expression. Thankfully, Zig loops also have else clauses. Wow, okay. I wonder if that works even when it's not an assignment. Like, can you just write while well, foo else, something else? Or does it only work when it's an assignment? Uh, if you do not provide an else clause, an empty one will be provided for you, which will evaluate to the void type probably not what you want. So consider the else clause essential when using loops as expressions. See if you can fix the problem with this program. Well, is it that it doesn't have an else clause? Incompatible types, optional const u8 and void. Do I want to return? Expected semicolon after declaration. Maybe just null. Oh, I see. So maybe it was. Value of type type of null ignored. Optional slice of const u8. I wonder why one's okay and one's not. Oh, well, it doesn't have curly braces around it here. Maybe it just has to not be a block. Maybe blocks aren't statements. Loop bodies are blocks, which are also expressions. That's what I meant. We've seen how they can be used to evaluate and return. Oh, blocks are also expressions. So, if it's happy with this one, why is it not happy with this one? 
value of type type of null ignored but it said blocks are also expressions okay loop bodies are blocks which are also expressions we've seen how they can be used to evaluate and return values to further expand on this concept, it turns out we can also give names to blocks by applying a label. Once you give a block a label, you can use break to exit from that block with a colon. As we've just learned, you can return a value using a break statement. Does that mean you can return a value from any labeled block? Yes, it does. Okay, cool. Labels can also be used with loops. Being able to break out of nested loops at a specific level is one of those things that you won't use every day, but when the time comes, it's incredibly convenient. Being able to return a value from an inner loop is sometimes so handy, it almost feels like cheating. It can help you avoid creating a lot of temporary variables. In the above example, the break exits from the outer loop and returns the value two. Finally, you can also use block labels with the continue statement. Yep, fine. Oops, we forgot to return a mac and cheese as the default food. It's menu zero. Uh, if we get this far, the required ingredients were all wanted. Please return this food. The zig compiler provides built-in functions. You've already gotten used to seeing an import at the top of every ziglings exercise. We've also seen int cast and enum to int. Built-ins are special because they are intrinsic to the zig language itself, as opposed to being provided in the standard library. They're also special because they can provide functionality that is only possible with help from the compiler, such as type introspection. Zig currently provides 101 built-in functions. We're certainly not going to cover them all, but we can look at some interesting ones. Before we begin, know that many built-in functions have parameters marked as comp time. It's probably fairly clear what we mean when we say that these parameters need to be known at compile time, but rest assured we'll be doing the comp time subject real justice soon. First built in al alphabetically is add with overflow. At add with overflow, first argument comp time t is a type. A has type t, B has type t, result is a pointer to t. Turn to Boolean. That looks like a really annoying way to do add with overflow. Maybe that's on purpose so that you don't use it. Check out our fancy formatting. Print as a binary number, zero pad, right aligned to four digits. Let's make sense of this answer. If there was no overflow at all while adding five to A, what value would my result hold? Write the answer into expected result. Uh, if there was no overflow, it would have a carry bit in front of this. One, zero, zero, one, zero. Bit reverse. Integer is the value to reverse. So it just takes one argument. Z 
Zig has built in some mathematical operations and lots of typecasting operations. Spending part of a rainy day skimming through the complete list of built-ins wouldn't be a bad use of your time. There are some seriously cool features. Okay, for now we're going to complete our examination of built-ins by exploring just three of Zig's many introspection abilities. This returns the innermost struct enum or union. Oh, it didn't tell us you could attach functions to enums and unions. The function calls is that. Returns information about any type in a type info union, which will contain different information depending on which type you're examining. Type of returns the type common to all input parameters. Type is resolved using the same peer type resolution process. I wonder if then there is a super type that everything is an instance of. Maybe just type. Not sure. Functions which return types start with uppercase letters as do structs and enums it would seem. Oops, we cannot leave me and myself fields undefined. Please set them here. Fields is a slice of struct fields. Please complete these if statements so that the field name will not be printed if the field is of type void. Okay. So we want if field type is not equal to void. Oops. This feels a little bit um, vague now. <coughs> How can a type be a value? Oh dear, we seem to have done something wrong when calling this function. We called it as a method, which would work if it had a self parameter, but it doesn't see above. So this is a class method rather than an instance method. Compile time is a program's environment while it is being compiled. In contrast, runtime is the environment while the compiled program is executing, traditionally as machine code on a hardware CPU. Errors make an easy example. Compile time error caught by the compiler. Runtime error either caught by the program itself or by the host hardware or operating system. All compiled languages must perform a certain amount of logic at compile time. Optimizing compilers figure out how much of a program can be inlined. Unrolling loops. Zig takes these concepts further by making these optimizations an integral part of the language itself. All numeric literals in Zig are of type comp time int or comp time float. They're of arbitrary size. Notice how we don't have to specify a size like U8, I32, or F64 when we assign identifiers immutably with const. When we use these identifiers in our program, the values are inserted at compile time into the executable code. The identifiers const int and const float don't exist in our compiled application. So this isn't like Go where it does uh, automatic type inference. This is actually a type of value which only exists at compile time. Then what does it get coerced to here? Maybe 
the smallest thing that can hold it. But something changes when we assign the exact same values to identifiers mutably with var. To be mutable at runtime, these identifiers must refer to areas of memory. In order to refer to areas of memory, Zig must know exactly how much memory to reserve for these values. Therefore, it follows that we just specify numeric types with specific sizes. Yeah, but what are they coerced into up here? Not clear. Might be funny to do U14. U14 cannot represent, oh, okay, fine. Immutable. Oh, it wants to take it here. We've seen that Zig implicitly performs some evaluations at compile time, but sometimes you'll want to explicitly request compile time evaluation. For that, we have a new keyword, comp time. When placed before a variable declaration, comp time guarantees that every usage of that variable will be performed at compile time. As a simple example, compare these two statements. The first one gives us an error because Zig assumes mutable identifiers will be used at runtime, and we have not assigned a runtime type. Trying to use a comp time int of undetermined size at runtime is a memory crime, and you are under arrest. The second one is okay because we're told we've told Zig that var2 is a compile time variable. Zig will help us ensure that this is true and let us know if we make a mistake. Allocate some arrays using a variable count, but something's missing. The type. Oh, comp time. You can also put comp time before a function parameter to enforce that the argument passed to the function must be known at compile time. We've actually been using a function like this the entire time. Studded.debug.print. The format string must be known at compile time. Notice that the format string parameter is marked as comp time. One of the neat benefits of this is that the format string can be checked for errors at compile time rather than crashing at runtime. The actual formatting is done by studded.format.format and it contains a complete format string parser that runs entirely at compile time. That's cool. I wonder then if the format string is passed again at runtime or at compile time, the format string is turned into code. Not sure which one would be better. This struct is the model of a model boat. We can transform it to any scale we would like. This is even smaller. We did something neat here. We've anticipated the possibility of accidentally attempting to create a scale of one to zero. Rather than having this result in a divide by zero error, we've turned this into a compile error. However, does that not mean that the scale parameter needs to be known at compile time? So you couldn't, for example, take the scale parameter from user input. This is probably the correct solution most of the time. Really? Please change this so that it sets a zero scale to one instead. Hey, we can't just pass this runtime variable as an argument to the scale me method. What would let us do that? One of the more common uses of comp time function parameters is passing a type to a function. In fact, types are only available at compile time, so the comp time keyword is required here. Please take a moment to put on the wizard hat which has been provided for you. We're about to use this ability to implement a generic function. 
Here we declare arrays of three different types and sizes that compile time from a function call. This function is pretty wild because it executes at runtime as part of the final compiled program. The function is compiled with unchanging data sizes and types, and yet it also allows for different sizes and types. This seems paradoxical. Paradoxic, paradoxical. How could both things be true? To accomplish this, the zig compiler actually generates a separate copy of the function for every size type combination. So in this case, three different functions will be generated for you, each with machine code that handles that specific data size and type. Please fix this function so that the size parameter is guaranteed to be known at compile time. Okay, that means we need to write comp time. Two, sets the size of the array of type T. That's cool. That's kind of like templates in C++, except um, any argument to the function can just be declared as a compile time thing instead of having to put the compile time stuff in a separate argument list. Cool. Being able to pass types to functions at compile time lets us generate code that works with multiple types, but it doesn't help us pass values of different types to a function. For that, we have the AnyType placeholder, which tells Zig to infer the actual type of a parameter at compile time. Then we can use built-ins to determine more about the type. This logic will be performed entirely at compile time. Let's define three structs, duck, rubber duck, and duct. Notice that duck and rubber duck both contain waddle and quack methods, also known as decals. Waddle, quack, waddle, quack, listen, connect. This function has a single parameter which is inferred at compile time. So any type is implicitly comp time. It uses built-ins type of and has decal to perform duck typing. If it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, then it must be a duck. We'll use has decal to determine if the type has everything needed to be a duck. In this example has increment will be true if it has an increment method. So as decal by type walk as decal by type quack. Quack, ducky one, true, squeak, ducky two, true, ducky three, false. Have you kept the wizard hat on? Yes, I've kept the wizard hat on. There have been several instances where it would have been nice to use loops in our programs, but we couldn't because the things we were trying to do could only be done at compile time. We ended up having to do those things manually, like normal people. Bah! We are programmers. The computer should be doing this work. An inline four is performed at compile time, allowing you to programmatically loop through a series of items in situations like those mentioned above, where a regular runtime for loop wouldn't be allowed. Wow, okay. So it looks like types are themselves values, but only at compile time. In the above example, we're looping over a list of types. Yeah, fine. Remember Narcissus from exercise 65? He's back and loving it. Please use an inline four to implement the block below. Well, okay. Inline four fields field. field. 
There is also an inline while, just like inline for, it loops the compile time, allowing you to do all sorts of interesting things not possible at runtime. See if you can figure out what this rather bonkers example prints. Haven't taken off the wizard hat. Ah, so this has to be in line because the format string to print has to be comp time. So we're using these values as format strings and also as the values to format. I think then it's going to go, it's going to put the first one in tilde's and then the new line. And then in these, and then a new line, and then in these, and then a new line. I wonder if that would be useful in making a quine. Probably not. Here is a string containing a series of arithmetic operations and single digit decimal values. Let's call each operation and digit pair an instruction. Here is a U32 that will keep track of our current value at runtime. Starts at zero, and we'll get the final value by performing the sequence of instructions above. This index variable will only be used at compile time. Here we wish to leap, loop over each instruction in the string at compile time. Please fix this to loop once per instruction at compile time. And each instruction is three characters. As a matter of fact, you can put comp time in front of any expression to force it to be run at compile time. Execute a function, get a value, execute a whole block, get a value from a block. You can put comp time in front of any expression. We meant to fetch the last llama. Please fix this simple mistake so the assertion no longer fails. Unable to resolve comp time value. In addition to knowing when to use the comp time keyword, it's also good to know when you don't need it. The following contexts are already implicitly evaluated at compile time. And adding the comp time keyword would be superfluous, redundant, and smelly. At global scope, everything is comp time. Mm. I don't think that's precisely true. If you make global variables, you can do this sort of thing. And that's not the same as this, even though it's saying global scope is implicitly comp time. The test expressions in inline for and while loops. An expression passed to the C import built in. Work with Zig for a while, and you'll start to develop an intuition for these contexts. Let's work on that now. You have been given just one comp time statement to use in the program below. Here it is. <laughs> Just one is all it takes, use it wisely. The return value type depends on one of the input arguments. Quiz time, let's revisit the hermit's map. Oh, don't worry, it's not nearly as big without all the explanatory comments. And we're only going to change one part of it. Yeah. 
fill in the body of this function. You may recall we have to create each path struct by hand and each one took five lines of code. Armed with the knowledge that we can run code at compile time, we can perhaps shorten this a bit with a simple function. So I will just want to return something like that. Can you only initialize structs with the named field format? Or can they be positional? Uh, type path does not support array initialization syntax. Okay, they have to be named. Sentinel value indicates the end of data. Let's imagine a sequence of lowercase letters where uppercase S is the sentinel indicating the end of the sequence. If our sequence also allows for uppercase letters, S would make a terrible sentinel since it could no longer be a regular value in the sequence. A popular choice for indicating the end of a string is the value zero, ASCII and Unicode call this the null character. Zig supports sentinel terminated arrays, slices and pointers. Array A stores five U32 values, the last of which is zero. However, the compiler takes care of this housekeeping detail for you. You can treat A as a normal array with just four items. Since B is only allowed to point to zero terminated arrays, but otherwise, slice B is only allowed to point to zero terminated arrays, but otherwise it works just like a normal slice. Pointer C is exactly like the many item pointers we learned about in exercise 54, but it's guaranteed to end in zero. Because of this guarantee, we can safely find the end of this many item pointer without knowing its length. We can't do that with regular many item pointers. The sentinel value must be of the same type as the data being terminated. Zero terminated array of U32s, zero terminated many item pointer. For fun, let's replace the value at position three with the sentinel value zero. It seems naughty. So now we have a zero terminated array and a many item pointer that reference the same data, a sequence of numbers that both ends in and contains the sentinel value. Attempting to loop through and print both of these should demonstrate how they're similar and different. It turns out that the array prints completely, including the sentinel zero in the middle. Okay, fine, because it has a different implementation. So, the type info contained in my type is a union. We use a switch to handle printing the array or pointer fit. Uh, for my seek. Loop through the items. Expected optional U32 found U size. Okay, maybe then to unwrap this. I wonder if this um, if this quiz is broken in my version of Zig. I don't understand where optional U32 is coming from. Well, I'm 
guessing my sentinel is an optional u32 yeah type equals optional u32 Are you ready for the truth about Zig string internals? Here it is. Type of a string is a pointer to a constant fixed size null terminated array of UAs. Now you know. Welcome to Secret Club. Why do we bother using zero and null sentinel to terminate strings when we already have a known length? Versatility. Zig strings are compatible with C strings, which are null terminated and can be coerced to a variety of other Zig types. All but f may be printed. A many item pointer without a sentinel is not safe to print because we don't know where it is. Weird container is an awkward way to house a string. Being a many item pointer with no sentinel termination, the data field loses the length information and the sentinel termination of the string literal weird data. Luckily, the length field makes it possible to still work with this value. How do we get a printable value from foo? Um, we want to retain the length information, so we just want we dot length const uh, Do I remember how to take a slice? Oh, okay. We dot data. We were able to get a printable string out of a many item pointer by using a slice to assert a specific length. But can we ever go back to a sentinel terminated pointer after we've lost the sentinel in a coercion? Yes, we can. Pointer cast can do this. Check out the signature. See if you can use it to solve the same many item pointer problem but without needing a length. Cast. Destination type. Okay, and I just type the same thing. Value is data. Sometimes you need to create an identifier that will not, for whatever reason, play by the naming rules. Do you really? If you try to create either of these under normal circumstances, a special program identifier syntax security team will come to your house and take you away. Thankfully, Zig has a way to sneak these wacky identifiers past the authorities. No, this isn't a good idea, is it? I assume this is only for interoperating with other languages. What if I need to put a speech mark in it? Put a speech mark in it like this. Maybe. Looks like it. Struct types are always anonymous until we give them a name. So far, we've been giving struct types a name like so. Have we? I hadn't even noticed that. I thought we were writing struct foo. A struct is also given a name when you return it from a function. You can also have completely anonymous structs. This function creates a generic data structure by returning an anonymous struct type, which will no longer be anonymous after it's returned. See if you can complete these two variable initialization expressions to create instances of circle struct types which can hold these values. Circle 1 should hold i32 integers. Circle 2 should hold f32 floats. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Circle i32. Circle f32. Okay, 
an anonymous struct value literal, not to be confused with the struct type, uses dot curly brace syntax. These literals are always evaluated entirely at compile time. The example above could be coerced into the i32 variant from the last exercise. Or you can let them remain entirely anonymous, as in this example. The example prints a true b false. So I don't understand why how they can use array initialization syntax. Oh, because it's an anonymous struct. I suppose the fields don't have names, or oh, don't have to have names. Please complete this function, which prints an anonymous struct. Well, you can even create anonymous struct literals without field names. Okay, like we're doing when we call print. We call these tuples, which is a term used by many programming languages for a data type with fields referenced by index order rather than name. To make this possible, the zig compiler automatically assigns numeric field names. Since bare numbers are not legal identifiers, we have to quote them with the at syntax. Hey, wait a second. If a dot curly brace thing is what the print function wants, do we need to break our tuple apart and put it in another one? No, it's redundant. This will print the same thing. Aha, so now we know that print takes a tuple. Things are really starting to come together now. This is just fun because we can. Make our own generic tuple printer. This should take a tuple and print out each field in the following format name, type, value, example. So for each field, what are the fields, for example? Just, um, uh, type info of type of tuple dot struct dot fields and then we want firstly name type value so this is name this is field type and this is returns the value at foo.x that field to pull field dot name values of type struct field must be comp time known, but index value is runtime known. Line four. Great success. Anonymous struct literal syntax can also be used to compose an anonymous list with an array type destination. Otherwise, it's a tuple. The only difference is the destination type. Please make hello a string like array of u8 without changing the value literal. Does it need a size? Actually, I think I can put an underscore. Unable to infer array size, are you serious? Yeah, <laughs> okay, fine. Six facts. The memory space allocated to your program for the invocation of function is a stack frame. The return keyword pops the current function invocations frame off the stack. Like return, the suspend keyword returns control to the place where the function is called, but the function invocations frame remains so that it can re regain control again at a later time. Functions which do this are async functions. Why does suspend have curly braces after it? 
to call any function in async context and get a reference to its frame for later use, use the async keyword. If you call an async function without the async keyword, the function from which you called the async function itself becomes async. The main function cannot be async. So you call a function with async and it gives you a reference to its stack frame for later use. And the main function cannot be async. How do we fix this program which is broken by facts three and uh, five and six? You can assign things to underscore when you don't need to do anything with them. Do I simply underscore equals async foo? I wonder what you're supposed to put in the curly braces. So, suspend returns control to the place from which it was called the call site. How do we give control back to the suspended function? For that, we have a new keyword called resume, which takes an async function invocations frame and returns control to it. See if you can make this program print hello async. Because they can suspend and resume, async zig functions are an example of a more general programming concept called coroutines. One of the neat things about zig async functions is that they retain their state as they are suspended and resumed. See if you can make this program print 54321. Mm. Well, I can make it do one. That goes 54. Um, would I want to call this in a loop or is there a way to find out when it has completely finished? What if I call it in an infinite loop? Terminated unexpectedly. This output. Oh, yeah, okay. Mm, well, I don't like it. Seems like that is a bad way to do it. It has probably not escaped your attention that we are no longer capturing a return value from foo because the async keyword returns the frame instead. One way to solve this is to use a global variable. See if you can make this program print 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Sure, we can solve our async value problem with a global variable, but this hardly seems like an ideal solution. So how do we really get return values from async functions? The await keyword waits for an async function to complete and then captures its return value. The above example is just a silly way to call foo and get five back. But if foo did something more interesting, such as wait for a network response, our code would pause until the value was ready. As you can see, async await basically splits a function call into two parts. Invoke the function, getting the return value. Also notice that a suspend keyword does not need to exist in a function to be called in an async context. Please use await to get the string returned by get page title. The power and purpose of async await becomes more apparent when we do multiple things concurrently. Concurrently, foo and bar do not depend on each other and can happen at the same time, but end requires that they both be finished. We can express this in zig like so. 
async foo, async bar, await foo frame, await bar frame. Please await two page titles. Please pretend this is actually making a network request. Remember how a function with suspend is async and calling an async function without the async keyword makes the calling function async. Yes, I remember. But if you know the function won't suspend, you can make a promise to the compiler with the no suspend keyword. If the function does suspend and your promise to the compiler is broken, the program will panic at runtime, which is probably better than you deserve, you oath breaker. Okay. The main function cannot be async, but we know that get beef will not suspend with this particular invocation. You have doubtless noticed that suspend requires a block expression. I had. The suspend block executes when a function suspends. To get sense for when this happens, please make the following program print the string A, B, C, D, E, F. Ah, I see. I've got four X's to play with. Well, this happens first. And then we suspend, and then we get here, and then we resume. Nice. Um, Why is that getting stuck? Is that the end? Ah, oh, well, I, for some reason I thought there was like 170 of them or something. Oh well, that was fun. That was Zigglings. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.